Welcome to a Programming Languages virtual meetup post-recording for the fifth meeting of the coverage of From Mathematics to Generic Programming by Alexander Stepanov and Daniel Rose. In this video, we're going to be briefly covering Chapter 4, and then we are going to be hearing from Stepanov once again, waxing rhapsodic about Athens in the 5th century, stories about Marathon and Friends, but before we get to that, very quickly, a high-level overview of what is covered. Up until this point, the fifth meeting, we have covered the following chapters. And once again, as always, there is a link to the GitHub repo. And in that GitHub repo is a readings.md markdown file that is tracking the order the chapters are covered in correspondence to the lecture series the four algorithmic journeys. We are in the middle of the heirs of Pythagoras. The first journey was the spoils of Egyptian, and now we are on the second journey. And so this is why we're going out of order. We last covered chapter 13, a real world application, and now we are going to chapter four, Euclid's algorithm. And the table of contents for this chapter is as follows. There are about three and a half lectures that correspond to this chapter, and I can't recommend them highly enough. Stepanov tells many, many stories, not just about the 5th century BC in Athens, but also Socrates, Plato, Alexander the Great, Euclid, Leonardo Pisa, aka Fibonacci, and more. And spliced in together with the stories from Stepanov is the introduction of Euclid's greatest common measure algorithm, aka GCM. Subchapter 4.2 is where this GCM algorithm is first introduced using line segments, and then an initial piece of code is shown to do this computation. And over the chapter, it works up ultimately towards the GCD specialization of this for integers. And it's mentioned that we will come back to this GCD algorithm. We're gonna work on an extended GCD, and develop an intuition for something called the Euclidean space. But with all that out of the way, now we head over to Stepanov and we are gonna hear about Athens in the fifth century BC. Now I have about 10 minutes to give you one of the most, I mean, you see, we, you know, during these journeys, I had to visit different places and tell you about these places. And we got to the place for which my breath goes away. I become breathless and I cannot say how wonderful this place is. It might be the greatest place ever. This is Athens in the fifth century. It's a small place, roughly speaking, size of Palo Alto in terms of population. But we look at these words and if, let me tell you, each of the words listed in the bullet one should make your heart either beat fast or stop. <laughs> because it's just so wonderful. We start, yes, as, as in marathon. But let us think about marathon. It was a battle. You might have heard there was a battle. It wasn't just a battle. It maybe was the most important battle in human history. You say Alex is exaggerating. Okay. John Stuart Mill, who nobody will accuse of being an emotional guy like me, a hard-headed English sort of pragmatic philosopher, said that for the history of England, the Battle of Marathon is of far greater importance is the Battle of Hastings, 1066, you know, and all of that. So again, there is this remarkable thing. If the battle were lost, we wouldn't be sitting here. There would be nobody discussing triangles or mathematics or philosophy or literature or music. None of that would exist. It all, there, these battles, you know, I'm not a militaristic guy, but when I think about this battle, my heart stops because everything, it was this little place versus enormous empire. You know, if you look, they were fighting Persian Empire. They were fighting this, the, the, the name of the king was Darius. I mean, he just conquered Egypt. You know, he conquered the world. He was the ruler of the world. His army was 
in hundreds of thousands. Athenians could field about 10,000 men. That's all they could put, because that's all they got. And it wasn't they had a professional. They didn't have a professional army. It was a bunch of honest farmers putting on their you know, ar armament and charging. They really charged. It's, it's, they used this, again, when I, when I look at this list, every name, every place. It's just, so what, what happens? They, they f form a phalanx, the Greek formation. And then they realize, if they do what Greeks always do, which is slowly march in formation, they're going to die. Because Persians have these wonderful things called arrows, bows and arrows. And if you slowly march toward an enormous army, equipped with bows and arrows and darts, you're going to die. So what do they do? They run. They run at huge speed for about one kilometer, right? Sort of. And they charge through the Persian army, the unstoppable information. And that's why we're sitting here, because they were able to charge in full heavy armament for one kilometer, facing, facing overwhelming odds. So Miltiades was a great hero. Miltiades, I should have put him there. Uh, he, was, he was the commander, a great, great commander. How was he rewarded by Athenians, by the way? Anybody know? As exiled, he ended up in Persia. No, that would be nice. No, he was put in jail and basically starved to death. Yes. Okay. So he win, wins the battle in 490 BC, yes? That's the Battle of Marathon. There was a 10, uh, there was 250 year anniversary two years ago. The Greece issued a stamp. You should get me one. Uh, I think there are two accounts, actually. I think according to one account, actually, he's exiled. Right, right. First, it starts with exile. Then he is arrested and starts and died in 489 BC, one year after winning the most important battle in the history of the world. That's democracy for you. <laughs> so, but, I mean, when you go away, which you shall eventually in a day and a half, Google Miltiades Helmet. Why? Because they actually dug it out. This is this amazing thing. It's, a, it's again one of the miracles of history. This is the guy who wins the most important battle ever thought. One of the four great battles in European history, in my opinion. And what does he do? What would you do if you were this winning general? Well, you're not as dramatic as an ancient Greek war. He takes his helmet, in which he just won this battle, and sends it to Olympia, to the great temple of Zeus, as he is offering. And then they dig the dirt at Olympia, and they found the helmet. How do we know it's his helmet? Oh, it says right there on the edge, you could see the picture, Miltiades. It was his helmet. So the fact that we have the helmet of the guy who, I, I think, it, isn't it wonderful? I think it is wonderful. So Salamis, another great battle. Yeah, because Persians wouldn't stop. So Darius dies. So his son, Xerxes, Xerxes is named after him. No, uh, Xerxes. He needs to punish those Athenian upstarts. So he assembles an enormous army. Millions, they say. And I believe it. I mean, he's the emperor of the world. Why not? And he marches. This is 10 years after. Right? 480. Right? He marches. Are you All of you heard of Leonidas and Spartans stopping them for three days. They just stopped them for three days. Then comes this great event. First of all, Athenians are prepared to sacrifice their city. Every Athenian packs his bags, takes his children, and then they evacuate the entire city. 
they move to Salamis, the island opposite Athens. All of them, they abandon everything. Acropolis, the great temples, right? And I wasn't planning to tell you this story, but I couldn't stop. Uh, so the, so they, they go there. They have nothing. And the huge Persian army marches into Athens, burns everything, burns the temples, out of spite. They're not Persians in general, are quite tolerant of other religions. Remember, they were the ones who allowed to Jews to come back and start rebuilding the temple. They're tolerant guys, civilized. They just want to rule the world. You know, free trade. They were into free trade. So they, they conquer Athens, burn it. And then Xerxes, the king, puts his royal throne on top of the Acropolis sits there, and he's watching this great naval battle. He's going to see his fleet destroy this Athenian and their allies' fleet, and that will be the end. Sort of for him, it's a big spectacle. He really views it as a performance of the lifetime. It's really happened, guys. So he sits there watching the thing, and there is this amazing battle led by another great Greek hero, I did put him there, Themistocles. And the Persian fleet is utterly decimated because it's much larger, it's much more powerful. But Greeks realize that if they fight in the straits, Persians will not be able to maneuver. Themistocles is very clever. They destroy the fleet. Civilization is saved. The guy up there on the throne has to pack his bags and run all the way back to Persepolis in Persia. Again, it takes you know, another year of more pipe operations and one more great battle of Plataea to, to fully handle this Persian threat. But Greeks never forgot. So 130 years later, whatever it is, 140 years later, when Alexander conquers Persia, he burns Persepolis. Why? to pay for what they did to Athens, because Athens is so wonderful. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you learned something. If you would like more content like this, be sure to subscribe. And you can also check out one of my three podcasts or links to all of my socials. They are in the description down below.